not understand the meaning of words. You do not understand the meaning of words until you understand why the person used those words. So, welcome LVC. My name is Jermaine Tafawa. I'm an elder here at LVC. I'm glad to be with you guys here today. Today we're gonna to do a Bible study, a participatory Bible study. Now, I started off with that phrase, and I'll repeat it again. You do not understand the meaning of words until you understand why the person used those words. Remember that as we do this Bible study today. And as we kick off, I should start us off with um, a word of prayer. So if you will, bow your heads with me. Thank you, God, for this time and space. Thank you, God, that you are across all time and all space, that you are here with us as we do this Bible study. You are here with the viewers as they watch this. And likewise, you were with Paul when he, you inspired him to write these words as we study Ephesians. And you're with us as we interpret and understand those words, as we study and understand what he meant by them and why you inspired him to write it with those specific words. So Lord, please be with us, enlighten us so that we may know everything that you want us to learn from this passage. In your name we pray, amen. All right, thank you. So I always like to begin anything with context. So the context is we're doing a series called uh, Union with Christ. Now when we kicked that off two weeks ago, Jeremy started that off and he described, um, you know, he started by defining theology. He said, you know, theology is a study of God's word. And then he went on to say that there's, there's a global perspective many Christians have. They see Christ and then they see themselves separate. And so what he did in that first sermon was he used John 15 to express how that there is a, we are supposed to remain in him, abide in him, as opposed to seeing our, ourselves separate. Then the following week, he then went on to talk about, I think it was um, Colossians 1 or 3, uh, verse 1 to 4, where he then t talked about what does it mean for our lives to be in Christ, that our lives are actually under and beneath him, where it's now Christ's life that we're living. So now, if you have not looked at those two sermons, I definitely encourage you to do so, because this Bible study is going to build on that series. But if you haven't had a chance to do that, don't worry. The tools you'll learn today, we're gonna, you can actually take these tools, apply them to the passages that were studied, John 15 and Colossians 3, 1 to 4, and I think you'll be even more enlightened about how these tools would, would bring more meaning to you. So, as we begin, I think it's always helpful to frame and, uh, the context for today. So for today, I did say we're going to do a Bible study. So what do I mean by we're going to do a Bible study? So we're going to literally go through a few tools, three at most, and we're going to apply them to this scripture we're studying in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And as we, do, as we apply the tools, and they're fun tools, don't worry, um, we will then try to extract patterns. So what do these tools, how do they help us extract patterns? And when we get the patterns, we'll then try to extract meaning. And hopefully that will be the take home that we have for today. So again, I'd like to thank our audience. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for participating in this experiment. Um, and I definitely want you guys to participate, to share freely. Again, don't worry, we can cut out those parts. And um, it will be important because your participation will show everybody else who's watching this video how to actually, um, what they can learn, how they can participate, how they can maybe understand these tools since they can't be with us live. Great. So with that, now let me now talk to our audience um, that's viewing this. I want you to, at this point, to stop. I want you to stop. Simply put, this is not a video where you can multitask, doing some work, listening in the background, you can try and manage the kids at the same time, not at all. This requires 100% participation. It's a Bible study. You have to participate. Then, not only do you participate, this is a Bible study where you can actually teach your kids if, or you can teach others. So there are going to be lots of instructions. It might feel a little bit technical, 
but it's definitely going to require your attention, maybe even rewinding once or twice to make sure you understood the context. And don't worry, we, we've given you lots of tools. So I think Wenjiu already posted, um, either she sent to your email box or it's posted on our Facebook page, the instructions for today so that you can be able to follow um, at home. But you're going to require about an hour to do this, maybe an hour and a little bit. So if you don't have an hour right now, I don't encourage you to listen to the rest of this video. That's why I said stop. When you do have an hour, then I suggest you pick this up and then you can study this. Now, I know the habit we'll then have is to put this down and then probably never pick it up again. But I have to implore on you that now more than ever, in this world where we are physically separated as a body of Christ, one thing that I definitely saw through this pandemic is a lot of people struggled in their relationship with Christ because they were alone. And when you're alone, that's when the enemy tends to attack us. And so I really want to encourage us that this is a great chance for us to ensure we deepen ourselves with union in Christ. So maybe you stop doing it now and pick it up when you're ready, but make sure you definitely go through this study with us. Great. So that's the context. So now we can, we can dive into this Bible study. And as we dive in, I think it's always helpful to, to understand Paul. So simply put, I would say Paul is, is a scholar. When he wrote... This, um, this letter, he wrote it in a style that's typical of ancient Greek literature. So he literally wrote it in similar to words you'd, uh, or ancient texts you'd read like Odyssey or Iliad. So let's look at this passage here. Let's scroll up a little bit and see the whole passage. From verse 3 onwards, so there's a bit of an introduction. Then from verse 3 onwards until verse 14, that is one sentence. Now, in Greek, I'm told it's an amazing sentence, <laughs> um, but, I don't speak, you know, but I don't understand Greek. But when I look at that in English, I have trouble reading and understanding what he's trying to communicate. And so the tools that we'll learn today will help us disentangle this one long sentence so that we can break it out into bite-sized bits and be able to understand um, the patterns and from the patterns, then the meaning. So, I mentioned we're going to do three tools. So, the three tools we're doing today, the first tool is we're going to literally do repetition. So, when I say repetition, we're going to look at this text and highlight repeated words. So, anytime you see a word that's repeated, so again, as you guys, you can start preparing. As you guys look through this text, any words that you see that are repeated, you'll let us know, and then we'll try to highlight those words. So, that's the first pattern. It could be repeated words, it could be repeated phrases, synonyms, um, etc. Then the second tool we're going to apply is called sentence diagramming. So what's that? Basically, what we're going to do is, as I said, it's one giant sentence. Once we color code it, basically, from the first exercise, it's still one giant sentence. So how do we dissect it a bit? So with sentence diagramming, what we're essentially going to do is we're going to take, read the text, and any time we, anytime we come across a proposition, or a preposition, sorry, and I know, I know for some of you, at least for me, when I, when I learn English, I can, you know, I can speak it, read it, write it, etc. But as of the context, I'm like, what is a preposition? So don't worry, we have a cheat sheet for everybody. But essentially, you're just looking at you know, typical words of in, of, um, at. Or one of the examples I remember that I was taught when I was younger was anything you can do to a cloud is a preposition. So above a cloud, on a cloud, through a cloud. So don't worry, what we're going to do is we're going to apply those prepositions. And anytime we see them, we're going to move the text and break it down into separate lines so that we have just one to five words we're looking at each time. So that's the second exercise that we'll do. Then once we do that little breakdown of taking this long sentence into small little bits, we're then going to group the text to say, now, this group of texts, who is it referring to? Because if you read this, you can notice that there's Christ here, there's God, there's you, there's we. So this long sentence, who exactly is being referenced when? So that's the second thing we'll do. Then the third tool we're going to apply is called, um, I just call it the, the five W's plus the H. So all these fragments we've now taken, we're going to essentially label them and say, is this a who in this fragment? Is it a what? Is it a when? Is it a how? Is it a where? So that's the third tool we apply. Once we do that, then we're going to group things together based on this pattern, and then we're going to find meaning. Now, I'm sure you guys are looking at me being like, we're going to do what? But don't worry, don't worry. Um, I can give you encouragement. I actually did this exercise with my kids. So literally, this is something you can do with my kids. And my five-year-old, you know, I have four kids. My five-year-old, my seven-year-old were able to participate and do this. So don't worry, don't worry, don't, don't, don't be scared and run away. 
Uh, my three-year-old, you know, we tried to do it, but she kind of colored over everything, but um, at least she participated. So, um, and if you can't tell, yes, I, um, my wife and I homeschool, so while we do this tool, what you'll realize is that for kids, it's an amazing experience because they get to, you know, color code and they have to count and do all these things. But actually, you're teaching them to read ancient Greek literature and you teach them to read the Bible. So if they can do it, I want you guys to know that, yes, you can do this too. So if you're watching home, don't, don't, um, don't fret. You're, you're going to be well empowered with all the tools that um, Wenjiro is going to share with you and with everybody here that's participating in this Bible study. Great. So... For those of you at home, what I suggest you now do is you can pause the video, you can now print out the instructions if you haven't already, and then read them and then start doing the first tool. Uh, once you've done the first tool, maybe I'll even suggest you actually read all the instructions, do the first tool, the second, the third, and then do the patterns. Once you've done all four, then you can come back and continue with this video. At this point, um, I hope everybody at home has actually gone through all these tools and applied them. What I want to do now is I want to draw some conclusions from all the tools that you've applied and to understand what is Paul trying to communicate. Paul has essentially summarized the entire Bible. He said, God did this. Who did he do it with? A certain group of people. He chose a certain group of people. He chose us. He bestowed us. So he did something through these people. And then why did he do it? Well, he did it because that's what he wanted to. Then he sent his son. And what did his son do? Forgive us for our trespasses. He rescued us. And then who did he rescue? He rescued us. He rescued the Israelites. But what people don't realize then is, well, actually, the last movement now says you. So it's we. Listen, the first phrase says we who had hoped in Christ, in whom you. So it's now transitioning from that's what God did for all the Israelites. But actually, he did this for you, and you are now sealed with the Holy Spirit. He essentially just summarized the Bible, but he summarized it in a very specific way. Now, let me, there is no way I would have drawn that conclusion if I had just read this text myself without having to take the time to understand these tools. Now, there's a reason he wrote it in this way, and what I want you to contend with, what is consistent in all three movements? How, it's the how. How is God um, how is this story related to God? It's related through the how. It's in Christ that he, the, in the first movement. So the first movement is about God, and he did it in Christ. He chose us in Christ. It was before the foundation of the world that he already knew that he was going to use Christ. So he, he has done this in Christ. The second movement, we know it's in Christ because he's the one who rescued us. And the third movement, just look at the word specifically before the Holy Spirit. It says, you who believe or having also believed. So to believe, who you believe in. You have to have believed in who Jesus was before you then get sealed with the Holy Spirit. So you notice how he has now retold the entire story of the Bible, but with Christ as the center. So the question is, why did he take... Imagine how much time it took to design this, to write it in this specific way. Why would he take the time to write this and then recreate the story of the Bible with a specific focus of showing how Jesus is at the center? So what would be helpful for us at this point is just to pause and to reflect on this sermon series. So today we talked about, you know, this series is about union with Christ. When Jeremy started this off, he talked about how union in Christ with the first sermon, he talked about, you know, John chapter 15. We need to remain in him. We need to abide in him. So that's about us being in union with Christ. The second sermon that uh, Jeremy gave, he also talked about how our lives are hidden in Christ, that we need to live lives where um, we don't see our lives as our own, but our lives as Christ. That's about what we need to do to be in union with Christ. What Paul is communicating here is he is saying everything that God has done he has done it in Christ. It's almost, I describe it as Christ's union with us. So we have these two parts. 
Christ's union with us, how he has always, this has always been the purpose for him to be in union with us. And then we have the other passages from before that Jeremy studied where he expressed it's what we need to do to be in union with Christ. So you have both of them coming together. Now what's interesting is this raises a question, and I will show you how Paul raises this question, of what does it mean for us to be in union with Christ? How do we permanently remain in Christ? Because a lot of the language that was used by um, in the passages Jeremy looked at, they don't expect that is your normal state. Because it says, remain in me. It's not saying, well, you already remain in me. It's saying, no, you need to remain in me. So the question is, do you currently function from a perspective where you are remaining permanently in Christ? And if not, then how do you remain permanently in Christ? What does it take? So what Paul is actually presenting to us today is an answer to that question. What does it mean for us to remain in Christ? What does it mean for us to be in union in Christ permanently? But to answer that question, Paul is actually inviting you to read the book of Ephesians or the letter to the people of Ephesus. Because Paul is not just worshiping when he designed this specific passage this way. He wants to demonstrate that this is how much God has ensured that he wants to be united to us, that he wants to be in union with us. So he's in, it's an invitation saying, this is what Christ has done. Now what will you do to remain in him? And let's, 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 let's just double back to what I, first start, what I first said when we started today. The first thing I said was, you do not understand the meaning of words until you understand why someone used those specific words. Now, when I use this tool, I would not have drawn the conclusion of Paul trying to recreate um, the Bible and express it in a specific form. I didn't understand the words that he wrote. But as we study it, we're then able to uncover, oh, there's a meaning and a presence, there is a meaning behind why he used the words that he did. But at the same time, I have to honestly say that we didn't, we didn't actually spend time looking at the specific words. What we did was we looked at the, at the design of the literature, the design of the words. We looked at the colors, we looked at the repeated words, and from that we were able to draw meaning from that. But we've only gone part of the way. Because what we haven't done is to take the time to understand why did he use the specific words? Why did he use words like predestined? Why did he use words like blessed, inheritance? And unless we understand why he used those words, I would argue that you do not understand this text. And the reason I share that is because Paul is inviting us to understand this text, to understand what does union in Christ really mean? Now, a personal experience that I've had is I've always felt that I've understood the Bible. I've read it lots of times. And it wasn't until I paused and realized I can read the words, but when I read the words, I read them from my own eyes. And as long as I do that, I fail to understand so much of what's in the Bible. And what I've come to realize is I have very little understanding of the Bible. Yes, I'm an elder LVC, but trust me, I have very little understanding of the Bible because I realize that I need to understand why the person chose those words. And until I do that, I actually don't have a full understanding of the meaning. So the reason I did this Bible study was just to show you that small glimpse, that there's no way, well, maybe you could, I couldn't do that. There's no way I could have read that and seen that Paul had described the Bible. There's no way I could have seen that. But by taking the time to really dig in, it's not something you read. It's something you have to digest and meditate and you know, rip apart like we did and try to put it together in other forms. Until you do that, you only have a surface level understanding based on your own perception. So what I'm asking you is the same invitation that Paul is actually asking you. Let's read this letter. And let's actually truly understand what it means to be in union with Christ. Let's understand why he chose those words. And I pray that you would then experience the revelation that Paul has experienced, that he wants us to experience, to understand when we know why he used those words, the effect that would have on us would be the same effect that Paul had um, as a disciple, that he wants us to be in a continuous state of revelation. 
you should never be at a point where there's not something new you're learning about the Bible. It's supposed to be absolutely continuous. How many ahas do you have? I know one pastor once said, when's the last time you experienced an aha? And for me, what I've come to realize is an aha should be literally be as frequent as anything you can imagine. That you should always be identifying an aha. If you're not identifying an aha in the Bible, then I contend that you need to dig a little bit deeper. So these tools, yes, it took some time for us to do that, but these tools help us to slowly uncover and unpack this. So if you guys would accept this invitation, I'm currently doing a uh, Bible study on Ephesians. And don't worry, I won't be leading it. I know this is a bit of a painful exercise, but it's going to be led by someone called Tim McKay from the Bible Project. And what he does, what I appreciate about his style, is that he always answers that question of why did the author choose the words by showing you other parts of the Bible. And so he teaches you to understand the, um, the author's intent by the use of those words in reference to other words that are used in the Bible. And so if you guys are willing to, to go in that journey with me, it, it'll take a while, it might take a few months, but I'm sure that through that experience, you'll have both a greater clarity in understanding what union in Christ looks like, as well as understanding the words and their meaning. And it's actually through that experience, one thing I found is, as much as I could tell you the intent of, of Paul, you know, he's very specific about what it means for us to be in union in Christ, when he talks about how we need to um, look out for those who are different from us. But it's very different for me to tell you them than for, me to you, for, than for you to see them through Paul's eyes. When you see it from Paul's eyes, then you have an appreciation that can have an effect on you that no person can ever share with you on a Sunday service. This is about you being in union with Christ, and that only occurs with you taking the time with him through his words. So if you accept the invitation, then um, you can find the link below, and I hope you'll join us as we continue this study on Ephesians. Thank you. Thank you.